Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Elvin Taylor. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. The next hour is devoted to learning something more, not just about the world of shoes and ships and sealing wax, but about how, what, and why we believe as we do. A time for those willing to question what they think they know and what they may believe, those willing to be uncertain for an hour. I'm Eldon Taylor, and this is Provocative Enlightenment. All right, our chat room is open, and as usual, my partner, Ravinder, awaits you there now with bated breath. I don't know how you can have bated breath when you're, you know, changing information back and forth vis-a-vis a keypad, but okay. You can log on by going to provocativeenlightenment.com forward slash chat. We do have a great chat room, so Ravinder... Tell us all about it, please. We do have a good chat room, a great group of people. We share a great deal of information. There's also additional info that we post uh, on that page so you can get more information about the guests. And if they, if there are any earls that are important, we like to get those posted as well. And we have a video as well during the half time, which I find really fascinating because I like to be able to see the guests too. You get a whole different perspective on it all. So if you can join us, do come in. That is provocativeenlightenment.com forward slash chat. All right. In today's spotlight, I wish to discuss different forms of mindfulness. Mindfulness is generally understood as meditation, usually meditation with the intent of relinquishing the capital I, the sense of self, and entering a state of oneness. One is therefore taught to let their thoughts go by and not follow them like some puppy on the sidewalk following every set of legs that passes by. Instead, the teaching emphasizes the need to let thought just go by and focus on your breathing. Maybe you concentrate on whether the breathing sensation is greater in your lungs or chest or stomach than it is at the tip of your nose, but you're nevertheless coached to just stay focused on your breathing. Now, there's another form of mindfulness meditation that is very useful, and one I often suggest to those interested in knowing themselves. This form of mindfulness is also meditation, and focusing on your breath to begin with is a good place. However, instead of ignoring your thoughts, you accept them in a non-judgmental way. The thought comes in and you both acknowledge and note the sort of thought it is. Perhaps you wait for a moment to see what thought next comes and is therefore somehow connected to the last thought. If it is a thought you would prefer to place in a different context, say a thought about something you hate, then take a moment to think of how you might reframe that thought. For example, if the thought is about some crazy driver who upset you on your way to work, Just the reminder of this situation will generally create some emotional content. So take a moment and imagine the driver was in a real hurry because she needed to get to the hospital with a small child in the back. Clearly, this reframing idea will not only remit your thoughts, but ameliorate your emotions when placed in this context. It has the additional benefit of preparing or predisposing how you will respond the next time something like this happens. Now, there is another aspect to mindfulness that I also like to encourage. This technique looks inward toward those secret unconscious associations and beliefs, many of which intrude and even govern our conscious activity. To illustrate this, Please allow me to share some fiction from the HBO show, In Therapy. The therapist in this show, one Dr. Paul Weston, experiences an erotic transference with a patient who is a medical doctor that he's been treating for a year. Although it's difficult for him to admit, he has experienced a genuine countertransference. His patient, Laura, 
is a very attractive woman who is very outspoken. So without mincing words, she makes it clear that she's both in love with him and wants him sexually. He properly informs her that he is not an option, but his real feelings are not so easily extinguished. Meantime, his wife is having an affair. When she informs Paul of the affair, she explains that it is in part because he seems so removed and so indifferent to her. Paul fails to see that his obsession with Laura has dominated his thoughts for months. Like a dieter facing a tabooed confection, he has held it a few inches from his lips for a long time and can't quite get his mind off of it. Laura is the confection in this analogy. As a result, Paul fails to see his complicity in his wife's extramarital affair. When we connect thoughts together, we often discover links that we consciously fail to observe. When Paul seeks his own therapy, he slips in a conversation about sexuality and uses Laura's name in, places of his, in place of his wife. Now, what does that tell us? Listening to our own thoughts in a non-judgmental way, allowing them to flow and connect as they will, but remaining alert to the connections while questioning why they might connect can provide some genuinely helpful insights to our inner feelings and mental processes. It is for this reason that I believe this form of mindfulness can be so very helpful in sorting out the sources of unidentified anxieties, worries, fears, and the like. My thoughts anyway, what are yours, Ravinder? You know, I think that last example was uh, particularly good. Um, we do take on board ideas without really being aware of it. So you have an example of, uh, you know, the therapist has an attraction for his client and because it's on his mind, it impacts his relationship with his wife and he doesn't see the connection to it. But I would suggest out there, you know, there can be these trends where females get together and complain about how bad men are and how bad their husbands are and you can't rely on them for anything and I'm sure you know guys get together and do some of their own stuff they'll go on about their wife nags about this and you know and that kind of stuff can appear to be harmless but it isn't you know the fact is it hangs over there and it does influence so if you've been spending time um, imbibing in this kind of information and then you go home to your partner well it's going to leak through it's going to come out um, and it will affect you know so your partner says something and where it could be totally innocuous because your mind has been primed in this other direction well then you can take offense and there are lots of areas this applies across you know all different areas it was just another example that I gave so the kind of mindfulness that involves just paying attention to what is in your mind and choosing what you put in your mind. Choose it very carefully because it will have other, other effects as well. So as it pertains, at least relevantly, to this particular spotlight, are you saying that in mindfulness I might have a thought about my wife or my husband and then I see that my next thought is about my best friend and I wonder why would I think of him because I'm just had this bad thought about her. Yeah. And then I, I, I remember that, oh, you, you know, he was complaining and I kind of got it. Is that how you're trying to tie this together? Yep. All right. Absolutely. Well, I'll accept it that way. Otherwise, I thought, well, you're out in left field. You missed what I was trying to say. <laughs> okay. Never mind. You're in trouble now, mate. <laughs> you're just in trouble. Well, first of all, I have no experience of ever getting together with a group of guys and bashing wives, women at all, period. So I don't come claim out in to be innocent. I've just never heard that. It comes Obviously, out in entertainment. a little self-disclosure from you indicates perhaps you have been bashing husbands. Never. Or, I actually made a conscious I decision. I beg your pardon? I made a conscious decision about that stuff about 22 years ago. After doing it with your... Okay, never mind. We're going on. 
<laughs> Every week, I read some of your letters as our way of involving you while paying respect to the very important role you play in making this show successful. Last week, our show featured the work of Professor William Ferriolo, and we discussed his book, Meditations on Self-Discipline and Failure, Stoic Exercises for Mental Fitness, a book, again, I'm going to recommend to you. Jennifer wrote, I have always thought of stoicism as the old-fashioned, stiff upper lip stuff. Thanks for the show. The professor made a lot of sex. CB wrote, not having to prove to the world that I am special or deserve to be treated as special allows me more room to invest in being a more calm and balanced me. Removing concern for that which we have no influence leaves a lot of time for self-improvement. Very articulate guess. I really enjoyed the clarity he brought to stoicism. Alan commented, great show. Moving on, Gail wrote, I have your inner talk empowering intuition CD. It's great. Lynn wrote, I am both mailing a hard copy and forwarding an electronic copy to you of the article that I wrote that appeared in our local newspaper. How miraculous. They gave you an inner talk program free advertising. The paper reaches about 15,000 people, and I truly hope you will have new customers as a result. I already own and listen to many different Intertalk CDs daily, and I believe fully in your supportive power to reprogram the subconscious mind. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Um, how do you feel about that one, Ravinder? That's, I have no idea. I'm in the chat room. <laughs> oh, caught you again, paying no attention to the show. Okay, that's all the time we're going to take for letters today. But we do love your comments, so please keep them coming. You can opine by writing to me at Eldon, that's E-L-D-O-N, at EldonTaylor.com, or by joining me on Facebook at Dr. Eldon Taylor. We do sincerely appreciate your thoughts and ideas. Now we have an event coming up pretty soon at East West Book in Seattle. I hope you're now paying attention, Ravinder, because it's your turn to share with everybody what this event's about. You know, we are doing two separate presentations. They will complement each other, but they're also totally independent, so you don't have to attend both of them, uh, but you can, and we would love to see you there. So on Monday, Friday, the 30th of March, from 7.30 to 9 p.m., we are doing a presentation on self-sabotage, why we undermine our goals and how to stop. And the fact is we all undermine our own goals, and that can sound really weird and strange, but once you understand what what's going on you'll see why you haven't managed to break out and you know achieve the success in business or relationships whatever it is um you'll definitely get some insights there and then on saturday march 31st the presentation is from one o'clock to five o'clock now last week when i told you about it i told you it was from noon to four and i don't know how i messed up i do apologize I double-checked all of that, and it is from 1 o'clock to 5 o'clock, and we are talking about mind mastery for life mastery, unlocking the inner door to self-actualization. It's about taking it further. It's about exploring how high is up. It's about understanding how your mind works and finding a way to tune that so that it works optimally for you. Um, so I do hope you can join us. If you can, definitely come up to us and tell us you heard about it, about us on the radio show or on Facebook how, or however else that, you know, you are connecting with us. Um, we would love to see you there. So that is at East West Bookstore in Seattle. I look forward to meeting you all. Now to today's show, The End of Alzheimer's, the first program to prevent and Reverse Cognitive Decline with Dr. Dale Bredesen. His book copy reads, and I quote, In this paradigm-shifting book, Dale Bredesen, M.D., offers real hope to anyone looking to prevent and even reverse Alzheimer's disease and cognitive decline, revealing that Alzheimer's disease is not one condition, as it is currently treated, but three the end of Alzheimer's outlines 36 metabolic factors that can trigger downsizing in the brain. The protocol shows us how to rebalance these factors using lifestyle modifications like taking B12, vitamin B12, eliminating gluten, or improving oral hygiene. Close quote. 
All right, let me tell you a little about today's guest. Dr. Bredesen received his undergraduate degree from Caltech and his medical degree from Duke. He served as resident and chief resident in neurology at UCSF, then was postdoctoral fellow in the laboratory of Nobel laureate Professor Stanley Prusiner. He was a faculty member at UCLA from 1989 to 1994, then was recruited by the Burnham Institute to direct the program on aging. In 1998, he became the founding president and CEO of the Buck Institute for Research on Aging and adjunct professor at UCSF. Then, in 2013, he returned to UCLA as the director of the Easton Center for Alzheimer's Disease Research. So on that, let's get him in here. Welcome to Provocative Enlightenment, Dr. Dale Bredesen. Thanks very much, Dr. Taylor. It's uh, really a pleasure to have you. I, I have to tell you, well, I'll tell you everybody out there, um, your book, it, I found your book to be the most comprehensive approach I have ever seen to any kind of human disease. And although I'm going to ask you at some point in this show about some of the criticism that flies at you over the what some would call a shotgun approach, I think most of medicine should take that as opposed to this singular idea of a linear in, linear out. I highly recommend your book to anyone interested at all in preserving their best cognitive abilities. You don't have to have Alzheimer's uh, or dementia in order to benefit from your work. So I congratulate you on that, sir. Thank you very much. We like to know three things. Dr. Bredesen on this show, who is the messenger, what is the message, and of course, how do we use it? So to that end, please share with us what dictates your life's ambition and passions. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my life ambition is to reduce the global burden of neurodegenerative disease. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so... I have spent my life since I was a freshman at Caltech and I first read the book Machinery of the Brain by Dean Wooldridge and got very interested in brain function. I've devoted my career and we've had an active lab for 30 years now studying the basic mechanisms of neurodegeneration. Why? And you can argue that you know this is the area of greatest biomedical failure. Everybody, as they say, everybody knows a cancer survivor. Uh, nobody knows an Alzheimer's survivor. And of course, we've described in that book the first ones. Uh, and so the idea here is that when you look at the underlying drivers for molecular neurodegeneration, whether you're talking about Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, Lewy body, frontotemporal dementia, Lou Gehrig's disease, what have you, the idea was to determine the mechanisms so that we could fashion the first effective treatments. And we were very surprised to see that the things that we learned in medical school and in residency actually were not quite correct when it comes to these neurodegenerative diseases. And let me give you a few examples. Please. Uh, you mentioned the idea of a shotgun approach. Well, I, what we say is that everybody's out there looking for a silver bullet but what you actually need is silver buckshot. In other words, you need in a precision medicine type approach to target specific underlying drivers, but you need to get more than one. Second thing, when we learned medicine in the 20th century, we were taught to search for what? What is the diagnosis? That was the key. And once you have the diagnosis, you write a prescription or you do surgery or what have you, that was successful for infectious diseases, and that was the great success of 20th century medicine, was to combine antibiotics with public health policies to produce a dramatic reduction in death from infectious illnesses. Unfortunately, we've used the same strategy for non-infectious illnesses and for complex chronic illnesses, which is what we are now virtually all dying from cancer, cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's disease, which, by the way, is now the third leading cause of death in the United States. And by the way, dementia is the number one cause of death in the United Kingdom now. It has passed both cancer and cardiovascular disease. Wow. So unfortunately, we have used 
our checkers strategy for a chess match. We're now dealing with much more complicated diseases. So what we discovered is that when you look at the underlying mechanisms of Alzheimer's disease, you see that there are many different contributors. What we call Alzheimer's is, strangely enough, actually a protective response to different insults to the brain, and that gives you the subtypes that you mentioned earlier. And so we can now look at these, we can evaluate all the different factors with each person, and then we address each one. So it's a very different way of looking at medicine and a different way of looking at this disease. I, I think it, it's a brilliant strategy, and it, it seems to me like um, I, I understand from your description and the success that was had in the past uh, why it may have been so overlooked, but it also seems so obvious that the fact that people would criticize your work on that basis seems to me to be just a little bit, um, well, I'll leave that to the audience. Listen. You have a lot of strategies. They include things like uh, diet and lifestyle changes. You heard today's spotlight, doctor. Um, is there a role in this for mindfulness? Does that facilitate in any way a cognitive enhancement in your opinion? Well, yeah, and that's not just my opinion. It's published data, of course. Uh, and you know, improvement in neuroplasticity, reduction of blood pressure, improvement in cardiovascular parameters. So, certainly, this is you know well known. And you know, as a scientist, and I've spent you know all, virtually all my career in the lab, so uh, I haven't seen too many patients until more recently. I, I actually thought I would I would die seeing transgenic mice, uh, but in fact, it's turned out now that we can see uh, big differences for the first time in human beings. And you know, as a scientist uh, trained, who has trained that way, you know, if someone had told me 15 years ago that we were going to be telling people uh, to do meditation and to find joy uh, and to take specific supplements and to fast at times and to do exercise uh, and all of these things, I would have laughed. I, I thought that these things were unimportant. But when you actually look at the drivers of the disease, you find that there are specific things. As a simple example, when you drive yourself into mild ketosis through exercise, through fasting, through low carbohydrate diet, through a good fats diet, the ketones actually enter your brain, interact with specific histones, and essentially decrease the ability of those histones to prevent the production of brain-derived neurotrophic factor. So you actually upregulate the BDNF, which has an anti-Alzheimer's effect. So you can see direct links. When you activate NF-kappa B, which part of, is part of an inflammatory response, whether you activate it because you've eaten trans fats or because you've eaten too much sugar or because you've been bitten by a tick and you have some undiagnosed Lyme disease or because there's mold in your home, anything that is activating that NF-kappa B has a direct path to cleaving the parent of the amyloid beta that is present in the brains of patients with Alzheimer's disease. So you can see these direct mechanisms by which you develop Alzheimer's. And when we do the laboratory tests on these people, unfortunately tests that are not done by the vast majority of physicians, you can see why each person gets Alzheimer's. So the, really the problem here has been that we have been trying in the past to treat this disease without knowing what causes it. When I was a little boy, there was a guy who would say, you know, I'm working on my second billion dollars. And people would say, wow, that's amazing. And he'd say, yeah, well, the first billion was too hard, so I decided to skip that one, <laughs> and I just decided I'd go for my second. So this is exactly what we've done as physicians. We've said, look, it's too hard to figure out what causes Alzheimer's, so let's just try to treat it with this drug, with that drug. And so, as you know, in one decade, 244 clinical trials for drugs, 243 failed outright, and the one that succeeded had only a minimal effect. So really, it, people have been going about it the wrong way. You, you know, there's a debate I'm going to ask you to weigh in on here. To me, the answer seems obvious, but... <clears throat> You're the professional in that area, so I'm going to obviously pass to your power. There are those that argue traditionally medicine has looked at the human condition in a very mechanical way. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> and then there are those that are now saying, well, you see the import of the power of the mind, how, you know, meditation can literally increase cognitive abilities, uh, change the physical structure of the brain, even add gray matter to the brain. So clearly it's no longer a mechanical issue. Now, I hear you discuss, you know, the two, and, t- and, and to me it seems like, well, it's still mechanics, even if I'm using my mind instead of, you know, you hitting my knee with a rubber hammer. What What is your view there? Are, are, where do we come down? Are we moving towards a holistic approach, or are we just revising the old mechanical model? Yeah, there's no question that these things are intimately intertwined. And one of the things that we've seen that's been really interesting is that people are not ready to listen to certain things. So and I mentioned in the book, one of the guys who went in and had a low hippocampal volume, had well di- well-documented Alzheimer's disease, and increased his hippocampal volume while he was on the protocol from the 17th percentile for his age to the 75th percentile for his wow. age. Just a dramatic increase. And it was you know, clearly there. The data were unquestionable. The neuroradiologist called and said, well, you know, we've made a mistake. Something's wrong. And I said, well, what do you mean? This guy's doing much better subjectively, doing much better on his testing. Why would you think that his hippocampus wouldn't increase? And he said, because it's not possible. He said, we've never seen this in 75,000 MRIs at our hospital. I said, yeah, but that's because you have had, not had people who've done this well before. So the bottom line is that there are these links, as you say, and yes, there is improved neuroplasticity with meditation. And so you're right, we have to quit thinking of these as separating uh, the mechanical away from the spiritual, the psychological. These are all part of a coordinated system. There's just no question about that, and you see it again and again and again. And so the the key for 21st century medicine, though, is not to go back to the idea that, oh, yeah, well, you know, we're just going to do these things that that don't have any data. We're going to do something because someone tells us to do it because it sounded good. We now have the ability to look at the effects of all these things. So the key here is that there has to be proof. Look to see if you're improving. Look to see, in fact, if there's a change in your scan. Look to see if there's a change in your metabolism. I just talked to one of the patients yesterday, um, and interestingly, this guy had gone on the program back March a year ago, so been on it for one year. He's been able to stop his antihypertensives. He's been able to stop his cholesterol medication, his statins, and he's been able now to stop his type 2 diabetes medication. So all of those dramatic improvement. His mentation, actually only minimal improvement. It turns out he hasn't addressed what turned out to be one of the, the most important things for him is that he has fairly severe sleep apnea. All of these things work together to contribute to cognitive decline. Again, your brain is responding to specific insults, and you're actually making this, the amyloid that's in those brains is a little bit like napalm. So if you've got people coming across your border, you've got invaders, you are going to do two things. You may put down something to try to kill them, like napalm, but at the same time, you are downsizing the area. You're decreasing your arable soil. And so this is what happens when you are exposed to specific pathogens, for example. You produce the amyloid, and this was shown actually by uh, Professor Robert Moyer and Rudy Tanzi at Harvard, that in fact you make these as an antimicrobial effect. But in so doing, what we found is that you're now downsizing the overall neural network. So the old-fashioned idea that, hey, if we just get rid of that amyloid, everything will be fine, is actually backwards thinking. We have to find out what is causing you to make that amyloid. That's a wonderful analogy, a wonderful analogy. Uh, we've got a break coming up, Dr. Bredesen, so uh, let's move to that now. We're speaking with Dr. Dale Bredesen about his work and book, The End of Alzheimer's, the first program to prevent reverse cognitive de- decline. 
Uh, again, I'm going to strongly recommend this book. You know, I'm at an age where I'm paying close attention to that. And you walk into the room and you try to remember what it was you walked in the room for. Not quite there, but I've seen my wife do that several times, and I'm afraid of it, huh, Ravinder? <laughs> so, you can learn more about our guest by visiting his website at Dr. Bredesen. That's D R B R E D E S E N dot com. Now, we have a video for you in our chat room featuring our guest on the subject of aging. So if you're not in the chat room already, now's the time to get on over there, and you can do that by going to provocativeenlightenment.com forward slash chat. Do stay tuned. We'll be right back. You're listening to Provocative Enlightenment with Elton Taylor. Change has never been easier. Whether you wish to lose weight, stop smoking, build better relationships, become creative, enjoy ultra prosperity, or simply relax and promote self-healing, InnerTalk has been repeatedly demonstrated effective in the most rigorous of scientific studies. Our customers love InnerTalk. Sean wrote, I have struggled with bulimia for over 30 years and have never been able to lose weight without restoring to it until I used InnerTalk. Vicki wrote, My hubby has been using the Stop Snoring CD, and already his dangerous and raucous snoring levels have stopped. Celeste wrote, I recently graduated from Taft Law School with honors. I'm writing to tell you how much your inner talk CD, Excel in Exams, has helped me. With over 300 titles to choose from, there is something for everyone. Check it out today by going to innertalk.com. Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Alvin Taylor. Welcome back. If you've just joined us, we're chatting with Dr. Dale Bredesen about his work and book, The End of Alzheimer's, the first program to prevent and reverse cognitive decline. You can learn more about our guest by visiting his website at drbredesen.com. That's D-R-B-R-E-D-E-S-E-N.com. Now, we ask our guests for their favorite music, music that has some true significance to them, Music psychology is a field of research with practical relevance in many areas, including intelligence, creativity, personality, and social behavior. So we just played some of Get Together by the Youngbloods. So please, Doctor, why is this music important to you, and how does it inform us about who you are? That's an interesting question. Uh, So I, I grew up in Florida, and I was in a surf club, and so uh, I wanted to surf in, uh, in California, and a lot of us would uh, save up our money in the surf club. This was called the Greenback Surf Club. And we just actually had our 50th reunion just recently. Uh, so worked all year, very hard, saved my money, every penny, came out to California, um, and this song was playing. And so I, and I really fell in love with California. Now, unfortunately, after I'd been here for a few days, my surfboard was stolen. I had no money and I had to go home. <laughs> so it, it wasn't all perfect that summer. Uh, but uh, it was my first trip out here. And I, and I really got excited about the beautiful waves and the beautiful, uh, just such a beautiful state that it is. Interesting. Very interesting. All right. Uh, you know, when I don't ask these questions, Dr., I invariably receive email that says, you know, you, you you choose guests that you like and you don't, you know, air both sides of the story and da-da-da. So we make it a practice to ask the tough questions. And, uh, you know, you've already heard me endorse your book. And as far as I'm concerned, I'm going to say this up front as well. I think the minute you have an ad hoc attack of... You know, you that is a personal attack. You you discredit your own credibility. Nevertheless, one of your critics, very outspoken, all over the internet, says Bredesen is laying down woo babble, like Star Trek techno techno babble. How do you answer critics like that, sir? 
Yeah, so I always say to people, you line up all the people with Alzheimer's that you've made better, and I'll line up all the people that I've made better, and then let's look at the lines. And the response <laughs> always is, no, no one's made people better. Well, come and see them. We have over 2,000 people who are now on this protocol. Uh, and they, we have trained over a thousand physicians from 10 different countries and all over the U.S. And I can send you some of the emails we're getting repeatedly. And of course, we've published the first few. Uh, we've published the first 20 and we're now publishing the next 50. Uh, and then we're also starting a clinical trial. So, uh, you know, I was trained as a scientist. So this has nothing with, uh, frankly, I, I don't even think woo babble is a, is a real term. Uh, so this is this is coming directly from the test tube. So, um, you know, this is, I didn't come to this result by taking a course from someone. Um, we have spent uh, 30 years, as I mentioned, in my own laboratory uh, working on everything from fruit flies to transgenic mice to cell culture models. Uh, my laboratory developed the first cell culture model for neurodegeneration in a dish and published that back in 1995. So we've been at this for a long time, and believe me, it's, it's not easy for me to say my colleagues are wrong and have been wrong, but unfortunately, I mean, that's what the data say. Uh, and so, you know, the proof ultimately is in, can you prevent and reverse cognitive decline? And we're having unprecedented results. These are published in peer-reviewed journals. So I'd be happy to talk. I don't know even who this person was, but happy to talk to the person, um, happy to show them. Maybe they should meet some of the patients uh, and, uh, and talk to them uh, and, and see. We just had a, I just talked to the um, husband of a woman two days ago um, who went to a well-known hospital, was told she had Alzheimer's, nothing to do about it. She had a MOCA score of 18. That's Montreal Cognitive Assessment. 18 out of 30 is not very good. The average for all Alzheimer's patients is 16, whereas normal is 26 to 30. She went on this program a year ago. She's now scoring 27. In fact, her, her doctor at the hospital said, you know, what the heck did you do? She's back to normal. She's uh, gotten her driver's license back. Um, so she's doing very well. Now, you know, she's doing a lot of different things. I'll admit from the outset, this is a complicated illness. And so you have to address multiple things to get these effects. And there are many people who've tried it who've not addressed the things that are actually causing the problem. And they don't get such good results. The most exciting thing is that the people who do address these and do show improvement sustain the improvement. So we have the longest person now coming up on six years. Now, you know, six years after being diagnosed with early Alzheimer's, you're, you could well be in a nursing home. This person is working full time, traveling the world, et cetera. So th that's the exciting part. And she's gone off the program, by the way, four times. And each time she's gotten worse uh, within about 10 days. So I'm happy to address any criticisms. This is why we publish our, our data in peer reviewed journals. You know, I, I think science has done itself a disfavor in, in this regard. We all, you know, um, I mean, if you went to college, you studied stats. And, and if you did anything, you know, in the area of psychology or statistics, you looked at ANOVAs and ANOVAs. And, um, you know, the very nature of the design of a study is a single variable. Right. Um, and I think, you know, when you try to apply the idea of a single variable in an application where you have multiple variables, you have to change the definition of variable to the outcome as opposed to the the, the stimulant itself. It, 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 I think that's where a lot of this comes from. I know this much, Dr. Bredesen. I'm old enough that when I went to school, I was taught IQ was fixed. I was taught, you know, in your 30s, brain cells begin to die, and they're incapable of regenerating themselves, and so you're on a downward slope cognitively. Um, yeah, I was taught personality was rigid, uh, set somewhere between the ages of two and four, depending on, you know, the expert you were, you were reviewing. All of those things we know today and more are just simply false to fact. So I think when you say you, you have a radiologist who refuses the results of an MRI because it's simply impossible to be, he's living in the old tower with the old knowledge of the old textbooks. 
as opposed to looking at what reality is really producing. Let me let me move to this. Your initial study, as I understand it, had ten subjects. Yeah. Nine of those ten subjects are dramatically reversed. That was the initial peer-reviewed paper, was it not? That's correct, 2014. Yeah, share with us um, the, the difference between why nine instead of all ten of ten and what kind of gains these people experienced. Sure, and we published another ten that in 2016 uh, with more objective data, the initial ones were largely subjective. They, they went back to work. So the main thing, as I mentioned in that paper, six of them were struggling at work or had had to leave their work and, and went back to work and were able to. And actually, that included the woman I just mentioned a few minutes ago, um, who's been able to go back to work and working all over the world and, and doing very, very well. Uh, and so the, what the, we actually learned something from that first group. The tenth one who just continued right through the treatment and did not respond at all, turned out to have what we didn't understand at the time, and we now understand much better, which was a different type of Alzheimer's. You mentioned earlier the three different types. So type one is what we call inflammatory or hot. These are people who have inflammation due to various things. For example, leaky gut. Again, something we weren't taught about in medical school, but is turning out to be quite common. Type 2 is atrophic. If you, again, you downsize, if you have, uh, as an example, if you have, uh, you know, f if you have four children and you only have enough food for three, you can either let all four of them starve or, uh, heaven forbid, you should actually send one of them away and let the other ones uh, eat, uh, you know, and do just fine. And that's what your brain does. It actually downsizes based on what is available. So if you want your brain to downsize, you know, go ahead and live a sedentary lifestyle and be low on your vitamin D and your hormones and your trophic support and on and on and on. And so there are many of these different contributors. So that's type 2 or, or cold Alzheimer's disease. Um, by the way, something uh, that was recognized by the Ayurvedic physicians thousands of years ago. They called it, you know, vata in this case, so dry uh, so that's type 2. And then type 3, which was what we didn't recognize at first, is, which is what that woman had who did not respond. And now we have many of such patients who are responding. And that turns out to be toxic, type 3 Alzheimer's disease. And these are people who are exposed to what can be biotoxins, such as mycotoxins from molds, or can be chemotoxins, mercury, copper. And again, you know, if you are exposed to high levels of mercury or copper or iron, your brain makes amyloid because it is a wonderful binder of those molecules. So it is actually protecting you from those molecules. And so we have many people who are now exposed. And by the way, organic pollutants, that's another one. And so they are they are developing Alzheimer's due to their response to this. And it's, it actually looks quite different. These people tend to be younger. They're often in their 50s. This often happens around the time of menopause. Um, they often have some depression with their Alzheimer's. It's often a non-amnestic. So it starts often with difficulty with organizing or calculating or speaking or visual discrimination. And then the memory problem tends to come later, whereas the other people tend to be older and memory, just as you indicated earlier, tends to be the first thing that you notice as the brain is downsizing. So it's quite a different form of the disease. We call this type 3 Alzheimer's. And for a good response to that, you have to determine what are the toxins that you've been exposed to. And then you have to have a detox program. And as you know, if you detox too rapidly, you can actually go backwards instead of forwards. So uh, so this is a, a this is a type 3 Alzheimer's disease. Um, and this is this is what happened to that first person who did not respond. Very interesting, sir. I, 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 I've got an aside here. I've got so many questions, but this one, I guess, is a bit selfish. Uh, I'm working on a book on music psychology, and I'm sure you're familiar with the fact that a dementia patient, seriously, uh, can, for all intent and purposes, go from a state uh, that appears to be uh, 
even coma-like. Uh, when they hear certain music, they're suddenly alive, they're dancing, their their cognitive abilities have, uh, appear to have fully returned, they're, you know, fully conversant, uh, memories seem to be intact, at least from the eras that you're, you know, that you're talking to them from. Is that a trigger in your mind, or is there is a redundancy that has been accessed because of the way we process music? So there's a very important distinction there. Uh, and so, and certainly, as, you know, as you've mentioned, this has been documented, and there's a film about it, etc. cetera, uh, the you know, Alive Inside, wonderful film. And so, yes, music activates... Uh, you know, happiness, it activates your dopaminergic pathways, it activates nucleus accumbens. So you get this response quickly um, with more activity and more interaction. But it's important to distinguish. No one's ever shown that, in fact, this improves your cognition and says, for example, no one's ever said, look, here's someone taking a test before and a test after, and now they score back in the normal range. That's something quite different. So, yes, you are stimulating the person. You are bringing back these wonderful memories, and that's a good thing in and of itself. But it doesn't necessarily you know, cure the Alzheimer's. It doesn't make it so that when you turn off the music, the person is acting themselves again and is back to normal. That's a you know an important distinction. So the lucidity itself, as you say, is not representative of uh, increased cognitive abilities. It's just a, a change in the state of. Okay, is that did I understand that right? Yes, in other words, not necessarily. And again, this is not to say that music's not helpful. It's wonderful, and we recommend it as part of the overall program. But in and of itself, and again, this goes back to the idea that monotherapeutic approaches have not worked. We tell the patients, imagine you have a roof with 36 holes in it because we initially identified 36 different contributors to the problem then fixing one of them is not going to help you that much. Music is a wonderful thing, and it patches one hole beautifully, but it doesn't patch the other 35. And if you're going to get the best results, you want to include the other things as well. Okay. You, and we're running short in time. We've only got a couple of minutes. You recommend that everybody at the age of 45 gets a cognoscopy. Right. Tell us, what is a cognoscopy? And why should we do it? Yes, and I've been told that that's a horrible word and I shouldn't use it again and that sort of thing. But it's easy for people to remember. When you turn 50, you should get a colonoscopy. And so what we recommend is anyone over 45 should have a cognoscopy. You know, it's just as even arguably more important to have a cognoscopy. So you want to know some basic blood tests. Most people know their cholesterol, for example. Uh, you should know your fasting insulin. You should know your HSCRP. You should know your C4A. You should know your copper to zinc ratio. And there's a whole list that I give in the book there of the things and what numbers you should be looking for and where you should target them to have optimal biochemistry. Because if you have suboptimal biochemistry, you are at increased risk. No different than having an off the charts uh, cholesterol that you haven't thought about or haven't addressed. So same idea, we can now look at the various things that are fueling the brain and fueling your synapses, and there are dozens of them, and you want to know these things to reduce your risk. And then the rest of the cognoscopy is pretty simple, and I have to say much less unpleasant than a colonoscopy. Um, you, in addition to the blood tests, you want to know whether you are at genetically at increased risk, APOE4. You have zero copies, one copy, or two copies. If you have no copies, your lifetime risk for Alzheimer's is about 9%. If you have a single copy, it's about 30%. If you have two copies, it's between 50 and 90%. And that's 75 million Americans have a single copy. Most don't know it. 7 million Americans have two copies. Most don't know it. They People have have uh, decided not to get this often because they feel that there's nothing that can be done about it. And actually, there's a tremendous amount that can be done. And there's a wonderful website, by the way, a social networking website with over 3,000 people who are all APOE4 positive and doing well and sharing information. It's called APOE4.info. So then... You want to have a simple online cognitive assessment. You can do a you know you can do a MOCA test for free. You can also do things like CNS Vital Signs, uh, very uh, inexpensively, and get your background and see where you stand. If you are asymptomatic, that's all you need to do. 
that will give you, and we actually have a computer-based algorithm we use. We can generate what we call a recode report that will tell you where you stand. Again, no different than something you'd get, for example, from Boston Heart that says, you know, here's where you stand with your lipid profile. Same idea. If you're symptomatic, you'll also want to have an MRI with volumetrics. So it's a pretty simple thing to do. You want to know it so that you can decrease. And the reality is we can, with what we know now, dramatically reduce the global burden of dementia. The book, The End of Alzheimer's, the first program to prevent and reverse cognitive decline. We do our homework on this show. As far as I'm concerned, this is all very credible. This is a wonderful step forward in health care, and it's a wonderful step forward not just for Alzheimer's or cognitive decline, but in the way we approach health care. I highly recommend it. Dr. Bredesen, I want to thank you for your willingness to share your work with us and for your contribution, sir. We've come to the end of another episode of Provocative Enlightenment. I want to thank all of you for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed our show and will join us again next week, same time and same place. And do tell your friends, let's have them join us as well. Okay, until next time, wherever you are in the world, remember, believing in yourself always matters. Provocative Enlightenment has been brought to you by Progressive Awareness Research and other sponsors. Provocative-